Welcome to the Production Talk podcast with me, Jan of mixartist.com.au. In this podcast series, we celebrate the modern way of producing music. We want to talk about all things related to songwriting, recording at home and music production. So if you produce your music at home, this is the place to be. Please subscribe and recommend this podcast to all your friends. This is the Production Talk podcast episode 18. Welcome back to the Production Talk podcast. Today is a special day as this particular episode is going to be released on my 46th birthday. I was born in 1975, which was a very special year in the world of music. Queen recorded their legendary Night at the Opera album over the course of four months in mid-1975 and released the album in November. Which means I may have been born around the same time when Bohemian Rhapsody was mixed. Also, in 1975, Rupert Neve delivered a true legend of a mixing console to Festival Records Studios in Australia. This legendary Neve AT38 console was later installed in Studios 301 in Byron Bay, where it was known as the 75 Festival Neve console. During this time, I only worked a few times on the legendary Neve console, but one of these times was the mix for a song that later won me an award for production engineering. The console is now owned by Turtle Rock in Sydney, but during its time in the mid-2000s in Byron Bay, the console was used as an inspiration for the design of the Custom Series 75 mixing console, which was built and manufactured by hand in Byron Bay. From about 2011 to 13, I worked as the manager of the Custom Series 75 factory until the business was sold to Burbank in Los Angeles, where it's still in production today. As you can see, the number 75 has a special meaning to me. And today I'd like to invite a true music production legend and studio veteran to tell us about the last 46 years of the music production business. Jim Bonafont is well known for the production of Cool and the Gang's number one hit, Celebration, among many other world-renowned songs from artists such as Savage Garden and Jimmy Cliff. Jim is a lovely guy and a real gentleman who loves to share his knowledge and experience with young producers today. So without further ado, this is our conversation with the legendary producer Jim Bonafont. Jim, thank you so much for, for making the time you know, to, to speak to me today. You're a bit of an industry veteran. You've been around for much longer than I have in the industry and you've been significantly more successful. So I'm, I'm really excited to actually speak to you about your experience and your past. And when I looked up your, your history, I found that the oldest reference or you know, credit that I could found was on the 1975 uh, Diodato record, uh, First Cuckoo, if I pronounce this correctly. Do you remember that? First Cuckoo, that's correct. Yeah, I do. I remember, I, I, I think I was um, assisting the engineer on that one and a few others. He did a number of albums at the studio I worked at. And the last few um, I recorded, the very last one we did together, I produced and recorded a mix. Uh, but he and I became very good friends. And it was because of our friendship that I ended up getting to work with Cool and the Gang initially. And then he left and then I ended up producing Cool and the Gang. So, yeah, that was a, a, um, a solid relationship, which actually... Uh, had a foundation in the fact that we both were accordion players as children. <laughs> so we had that in common and we combined oh, cool. over that. Yeah, yeah well. Yeah. Well, that was 46 years ago. That was actually the year oh, I was born and I consider myself oh, an geez. old fella and you were already <laughs> producing at that time. You have so much more experience than me. Was that one of your first recordings or is that just the first one that where you got credits for? That was the, it wasn't the first one, but it was probably the first one. That was 1975, did you say? Well, that's what Google said, yes. So I believe that's probably true. Okay, yeah. Then that would have been my first. I did I did an album in the end of 75 with a band called Dr. Buzzard's Original Savannah Band. And that was a hoot. That was on RCA Records. Wow. And that was the first engineering that I did. That was nine months after I started. So I was still mm. green. 
but <laughs> they wanted me to be the guy, so I couldn't say no, and I wouldn't say no. Yeah, right. So yeah, that goes back. Say, Jim, if you had a chance to speak to that younger Jim from 1975 and give yourself some advice that you wish you had known when you were young, what would that be? Well, that's funny you should ask, because one thing that I harp on to this day is, you know, um, personal interaction and, and diplomacy in the control room. And I think that's critically important. Um, to keep this brief, the reason that I made advances rather quickly was because I got along with people. Mm. And I didn't, you know, I knew when to shut up and I knew when to speak. And I really... Um, I had I had gone to graduate school and had a lot of psych courses in graduate school, so I kind of had an idea of, you know, how to how to interact with people and 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 not piss people off really, and and that paid off. That's how Diodato and I got got going and and cool in the gang. I mean, I, we did six albums together. Uh, wow. When I came to Australia, I'd worked with a friend, Charles Fisher, who would we I did some mixing for him in the states. And then he and I worked together on a number of albums here in Australia. So I wasn't the world's greatest engineer, I'm sure, but we, you know, I enjoyed what I did, and people seemed to be okay with me in the control room. And that's important because you can have <laughs> you are too humble. You can have a genius type who who can you know do everything under the sun, but if he's if people are uncomfortable with them, then yeah. They're not going to last. Most of the mm -hmm. time, they're not going to last. I think that's really important to to bear that in mind. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, again, I was fortunate to know that at the beginning, but I did learn plenty of things along the way that 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 were helpful. Okay. We rushed straight into it. Uh, I actually meant to ask earlier um, what your career highlights were um, in your time in the U.S. and nowadays in Australia, if you had any uh, particular moments in your career that were most meaningful to you? Um, there were many. Probably the, the most meaningful was on on the fifth album that I did with Cool and the Gang. For the fifth and sixth albums, we were co-writing. Yeah. And we co-wrote a song called Joanna, and that was released, I believe, in 83. Um, yeah, the end of 83. And um, BMI, Broadcast Music uh, Incorporated, is a performing rights organization mm -hmm. in the States, one of the two big ones. And it was, and that song was their most played song for 1970, 1984, sorry, 1984. Wow. And so they flew us all out to Hollywood and we had a big ceremony and celebration. And, and that was probably the most, you know, exciting time for me. Yeah. You know, uh, as you know from your own experience, a lot of the studio work is pretty grueling and you're just kind of grunting your way through it. And, uh, and this was something that was like a, a serious reward. <laughs> I remember. Okay, so there was a lot of recognition. Yeah, yeah, mm. and it felt really good. And I was so excited after that. I, I I called home to my parents, you know, and and I forgot about the time difference. It was one o'clock in the morning, and I woke them up and they said, "Oh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> We're going back to sleep," kind of thing. <laughs> But yeah, that was that was kind of one of the high points. But there were many yeah. times that I, you know, when I think back and reminisce, there was a lot of things that happened over the years that. You know, I'm glad that they did, and I wouldn't change. Fantastic. At all. And yeah. then you moved to Australia. Uh, how long ago was that? In 1986, I came here for a two-week um, vacation, really. I was in Hong Kong, and I called my friend Charles, who was living in Rose Bay at the time in the eastern suburbs. I asked him to come on up and, and let's hang out in Hong Kong. And he said, I can't do that. I've got a new baby. Why don't you come to Australia? And I wasn't planning on it, but I then changed my ticket. And I came here for two weeks to see Australia. Well, as much as I could in two weeks. And it ended up, I didn't see hardly anything because on the way home from the airport, he asked me if I would remix an album he just did with a band called The Cockroaches. He wasn't happy with the way it came out. And uh, I said, sure. So I spent two weeks at Albert's studio on the north side, and I drove by the opera house 14 times. And <laughs> that's all I saw, really, was the, the Harbor Bridge and the opera house. But that was really um, significant because that was my introduction to Australia. And uh, the cockroaches, who went on to become the Wiggles, um, 
treated me so well. And, and they were so, you know, we went to their parents' house for a barbecue and Tony and I played tennis and they took me to a cricket and to a rugby and they couldn't do enough for me. And I just felt like this is where I want to be. Mm. So the next year I came back and I stayed with Charles and his family for three months. Yeah. And we did uh, the first 1927 album. And then we did another album with an artist named Guion. Um, and they both did really well. And it was at that point that I said, you know what, I'm going to just move to Australia. And so in 1988, I came back and we did some more work together and, um, and, and I stayed. I got my, my residency a few years later, my citizenship in 96, and the rest is history. I, ironically, I got my citizenship in 96, and then two months later, we moved to Nashville. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but Okay. But, so uh, you still yeah, so, went back you know, you spent so a bit of time in the going, US occasionally. Going back and forth, yeah. Yeah. So good. Say so, and you've seen so much of the industry, so many decades. Has there ever been a time when the music industry was not in a, a state of change? Was there ever a long period of stability? Do you remember any of that? Or has it always been changing? Pretty much, pretty much when I started. Well, it, it, you're right. It's always been changing. When I started, which was '75, that was the midst of the disco era. Uh, R and B was changing a bit, mm. becoming more towards pop. Cool in the Gang originally was a um, um, like a funk band. And they had their early hits, uh, Hollywood Swingin' and Open Sesame and Jungle Boogie and things like that, um, were very different from what we did. When, when I got involved, which was 1979, um, the president of the label wanted to take them in a different direction, make them more pop, more mainstream. And so that's when we did songs like um, Get Down On It, Celebration, uh, Ladies Night, stuff like that. It was still R&B. But it was more mainstream, you know. It had a big white audience as well as a black audience, and um, yeah, that's things really started. I mean, in the, in the early '80s, punk rock kind of made made came on the scene, and I did some of that, yeah. some of that, and I guess all the MIDI production, yeah, and the MIDI production that in '83, and so things were changing as far as the studios were concerned because once MIDI happened. Then that that changed how often mm. people would need the studio. You know, a lot of people, even Cool and the Gang, their last album, they did all the programming at home, and we yeah. just came into the studio and we dumped it to tape. Uh, and the changes were more. I mean, they were musical changes as well, but the changes were more significant in the uh, equipment oh, because yeah. digital came on the scene and that changed everything. You know, tape okay. started to to disappear and. Mm. Um, you know, and then there were a whole variety of hardware, digital recorders, and then they disappeared. <laughs> and there yes. was uh, digital audio workstations, which is where we are now. You know, the CDs came and went, mm. uh, compact discs. Um, uh, one of those little things called uh, the little... Do you remember mini discs? Mini disc, yeah. They yeah, were around for about love three years for, or four years. Yeah, exactly. Years, yeah. And then they disappeared entirely. So, <laughs> Yeah. So a lot of things came and went quickly. That's funny. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, there were a lot of changes that way. Musically, uh, yeah, of course, people are always um, kind of taking things in new directions. But really, if you listen to a lot of music, a lot of it doesn't isn't so far from the original stuff. People are still influenced by the original types of music and, and things. And I think what's changed more is the themes that people write about. Oh, okay. I think they're a little bit more... Uh, As in the lyrics? Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Lyrically, things have changed. They've gotten a little bit more kind of down and dirty a little bit. I mean, so long, if you go way back to the like 50s and 60s, everything was safe. It was yes. just, I love you, you love me, you know, let's go <laughs> skip together into the sunset. Mm -hmm. And then it gradually changed. And nowadays, people are writing about some serious things, you know, rape and incest and all that kind of stuff that you read in the news. People are now not afraid to actually write about it in, in mm -hmm. lyrics. So uh, I think that's changed a lot. And then, of course, you know, the uh, using drum loops and, and drum machines and things like that. Um, has kind of changed the the texture of the music. Um, 
but some of it's you know some of it's very similar to what it was years and years ago. Okay, and uh, I mean, yeah. you know, my, my wife will listen to some things on the radio and say, "Oh, that sounds like so and so from the seventies," and it really does if you listen to it. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's. Uh, there, there's been changes, and as I said, to me, the biggest changes have been in the technology. Yes, because that's changed the whole industry. Mm, that's right. So musicians today are sort of expected to be the songwriter, and the composer, and the arranger, and of course the performer, but also the recording artist or recording engineer. And they produce themselves at home. They record themselves in their bedrooms using, you know, software. And then they're also supposed to mix themselves and sometimes even master and publish and release. That was not the case in previous decades, yeah? So when did that come up? Well, I think as um, equipment and, and digital workstations became more available and, and affordable, more and more people got on that bandwagon and started doing it themselves. And some of them were successful and... Um, Uh, you're right. They try to do all of those things, which I don't think is necessarily good. But sometimes you don't have the money to pay a producer, or you don't have uh, to pay a mastering engineer, and so you, you you just do it yourself. And some people are better at it than others. Um, you know, there's a lot to be said about record companies, even though they, you know, the big complaint with record companies is that you know they took all the money and they gave you just a little bit of the money, and they, you know didn't put enough in effort into promoting your record and all that kind of thing. But the flip side of that is they had every everybody that you needed. They had lawyers and they had um, PR people and they had A&R people and they had uh, marketing guys and, you know, the whole team was there mm. and you paid for it. Yeah. But if you had good product, you could, you know, you could make back the money that they lent you to make the album and then start to enjoy the profits. So in, in the case of Cool and the Gang, you know, they, they ended up, their budgets went higher and higher as time went on, but they were making much more money in record sales, and so it didn't really matter. Yeah. And now, with, with I mean, there are still record companies, but without record companies, it's really hard to track your income. And, you know, because of streaming and sales kind of diminished. Yes. Uh, I mean, everything's kind of streaming now, or more so. Um, the income isn't what it used to be. Mm -hmm. So there's now, the industry's changed. There's other ways that you have to make money, like merchandising and um, the live performance and stuff like that. And, and I'm sure more than that, but it, it's just changed so much from, from when I started, it was the record company. And if you did well, yep. the record company made it happen for you. Yep. And they would pay you. They would send you your, your royalty checks and you could count on it. Yeah, And um, that's all changed. Since you've seen all these changes through so many decades, if you had to, you know, pick a wild guess and look into your crystal ball, what, what's the industry going to be like in 10 years or maybe 20 years? What's your prediction? Well, it's it's hard to say. That That's a tough question. Um, I mean, obviously, we'll still have music. People will be performing and writing music. That's not going to change. Um, I think that there's a lot of um, outcry for, uh, I think artists and, and, and writers and people aren't really getting paid what they should be getting paid anymore. That's changed for the worse for them. Mm. And I think that there's got to be some kind of reckoning so that they so that it could be profitable. I mean, this is not a hobby. You know, this is a career that people are making a choice to do. And if you're talented, then you can, then that's a good choice for you. But you need to be paid decent money for what you're doing. And I think it's gotten to the point where that's hard to, hard to find. So we're, so getting back to your question, 10 or 20 years from now, I think it's got to shift back a little bit so that it's more lucrative for, for artists and writers to be in this business. I mean, that's maybe that's wishful thinking, but we're hoping. I hope it's not. <laughs> yeah. That would be fantastic. I think that's uh, definitely what the industry needs. So we've seen a big change in income where, you know, think about the 90s, uh, most of the time the money was coming from CD sales and the tour was used to promote more sales. And then in the 2000s, it sort of turned around where, 
there wasn't much money from you know, selling records anymore, but instead people were touring and making money from the tour. So the CD became the tour that was used to market the tour. Yeah. And now since COVID, we've sort of lost the income from you know, physical sales. Now that is streaming. And with COVID, we now lost the income from, from live uh, gigs. So that puts a lot of musicians in a really, really difficult spot. It's tough times now, yeah. for sure. Yeah. So something really has to change. Um, and yeah, let's see what the future brings. Yeah. And yeah, let's really hope that, I guess it comes down to a political will to some degree and, you know, um, also a bit of global coordination um, to make that work. But uh, yeah, I hope you're yeah. right. I hope, um, because, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that music, of course, will be around. Now people will still make music, but uh, yeah. It, it, it's got to come to a point where it really, where we make a proper return. Okay. Absolutely. Yep. So if you think about, you know, musicians today, uh, all the things they have to do, uh, you know, most of them produce themselves from home today. If there was one thing you would recommend them to outsource to a professional, which one would you pick? Which part of the production cycle there? Um, I think that, See, producers have become many things. And, you know, sometimes producers in, in the tr traditional sense don't come close to what they used to do. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, sometimes producers have money to pay for it, and that's their contribution. Sometimes they have the gift of gab, and they talk their way in. And But in some cases, the producer is the guy that takes a song and turns it into something. Yes. Um, and uh, Mark Ronson, he's a producer, right? He, besides an engineer and he he can you can here's the thing it used to be i'd come to you i'd pull out my guitar or a piano i'd play you a song and i'd sing it and you'd say yeah that's that's a hit that's a hit let's record it and you would get a band or you would get an arranger or you would get who whomever it took go into a recording studio and make that song come to life and that happened in many places in the united states it happened with uh, the Wrecking Crew in California and with the Motown band and with Muscle Shoals and all these studios, they had their own bands that could, you know, you'd play them a song and they would take it and they, the guitar player would come up with a part and then the drummer would say, well, let me do this beat to it. And they would basically put that together. And great songs came out of mm. that. I mean, you started with the song that was great and then it, it was interpreted and the final product was just sensational. I think that that's a real talent. And I think when you try to do it yourself, you're, you're selling yourself short. Yes, um, because, because you're losing input from, from musicians. Yeah, and, and nobody can be good at everything, in all honesty. Yeah, yeah. You know, and if you write the song, that's great. You should be thrilled that you can write. Because that's probably the most lucrative part of the whole thing nowadays. Mm. Songwriters are still protected. They still get royalty checks for airplay and licensing for films and co commercials and all sorts of things there's still an income stream for songwriters and publishers yes um so you know as a, an artist shouldn't feel bad about farming some of that stuff out i mean if they have a skill for recording and a lot of them can do a pretty good job of recording then they can record the stuff and they can get people to in involved to help out uh, mixing, I would say that's something else that uh, they should probably farm out mm. unless they really have, have nailed that skill. This thing, mixing and mastering, those are your last two shots to come up with something that's really going to be have some impact, you know. And I never, I've never, of, of all the things that I've done, I've never mastered my own stuff because that wasn't my expertise and I didn't want to, I didn't have the equipment for one thing and most of it was on vinyl, so I couldn't master it because I didn't have a cutting lathe. Uh -huh. But yes. I also figured that, you know, I spent hundreds and hundreds of hours recording and mixing it. Um, I don't know what I would change. I need somebody with fresh ears to say, yeah, it's good, but you really need this or you need that. And that's why I would, mm. you know, I'd always let somebody else do the mastering. Yes, okay. Um, so, yeah, getting back to your original question, you know, the production is important. Um and and the mixing and mastering, of course, is important. I mean, it's all important. But, you know, if you start with a good song, it deserves to be treated right. Yes, definitely. Mm. And as as you know, you can always get people involved, even if you bargain away some of your um, income or, you know, 
get somebody to, that believes in you to back you so you have some money to throw around a little bit because it's horrible to get people to work for nothing. You know, and mm. you, you need to pay people. Um, yes. So anyway, that's yeah, that's my take on it. Thank you. That's That was a tricky question, so you did well. Yes. <laughs> I like that. I really like that. It's actually something that, you know, I've uh, brought up before that, it's, you know, even today, a wise idea to form small teams of specialists, you know, to try to do as much yeah. as you can. But you know, in all honesty, find the things where somebody else is better and can take the production to the next level. So that goes right on that alley. That's really good to see. Good. Yeah. Um, all right. Say, how is the U.S. music scene different from the Australian music scene? What, what differences do you see culturally and musically and, you know, from arrangement or mixing point of view? How, how do these uh, scenes differ? Um, well, I think that year by year they're becoming more similar. Okay. As the world, as globalization affects every aspect of life, it's also affecting um, musical taste and and. and practices and things like that. So I think it's becoming more similar. When I first came here, it was pretty obvious that Australian music was grungier and it, it had more bite to it and it was more earthy and, you know, it was like more legit, not so glittery and popsy kind of stuff. But um, that's changed over the years. And now there's, there's a lot more similarities than differences between U.S. and Australian stuff. Um, the, the funny thing is, and I'm just getting off on a little tangent here, but I'll try to be brief. When I moved here, um, I worked on, a, on an album by a band called Euphoria. And I, I, I did vocal recording because that's one of the things that I like to do. And people hire me to get vocals to perform. And we got we finished the album and then they said okay now we're going to send it to new york to mi to get it mixed and i said why are you going to send it there well because you know we send everything over to the either to the, the states or or england to get it mixed and i thought well at that point i knew enough engineers including myself that couldn't do a good job mixing it, but they didn't really want to know about it because i guess they didn't have confidence in australia or they thought that by having somebody from the States or from England, you know, the name or the location mixed in New York by so-and-so would help sales or credibility or something like that. And then I went on to find that that was a common practice. And, that, and it's, it's actually, without getting into the tall poppy syndrome, I think that um, things... It turns out that any, a lot of the things that happened here and became successful in the United States, the bands were then, or the artists was then shunned by Australians because they made it big. And it's like, it, it turns out that with this one band, they, they sent their next album there. And then somebody from the record label got back to them and said, you know, this engineer that you're sending to mix it, he doesn't mix it anymore. He has assistant mix it. Mm. So they were sending it to a guy that wasn't even doing it and just taking the money. And I thought, wow, sooner or later they got to wake up to this. Yes. And uh, I don't know if they ever did, but mm. a funny thing. Mm. Um, but, yeah, so I, I think that nowadays, I mean, there's still differences. And, and culturally, you know, there'll be, um, you know, you'll get some stuff like New Orleans kind of um, – jazz and, and, and funk that'll be different from, you know, the things that are area specific in the United States have a certain sound to them that would be different from, um, you know, Australian probably is the same way, mm. you know, but I don't think there's any didgeridoo on any American stuff that I'm aware of. <laughs> but, um, well, that would be interesting to see you know, if, if one of our listeners yeah. uh, knows something please to post it in the comments that would be interesting to see <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm sure there i'm sure there is but it's just i never i never recorded didgeridoo until i came to australia so mm. okay and i don't think i ever saw one either Jim, you've been along uh, the industry for such a long time and you've seen musical careers, you know, starting from really small and artists getting really big. Over time, have you have you seen that there are any similarities between, you know, the character traits or, you know, work demeanors of, of those people, the, the people who actually got really far in the industry? Is there anything that you noticed? I've seen very talented people fail 
because of personality problems or egos, which would be you know, like part of a personality problem. Um, it, it seems like the, the the people that have succeeded start out with a product that is good. They've got some good songs. They've got some good song concepts, and that's basically the thing that's going to generate interest. If you if you if you if you, have, if you have a bunch of turkey songs, nobody's going to be interested anyway. So it doesn't matter what personality you have, people are still going to shut the door on you. Um, I think it takes a lot of enthusiasm, and it takes a person that can can pick themselves up after, you know, because everybody gets disappointments along the way. So I think if you can kind of shake it off and, and say, no, I'm going to do this, and nobody's going to tell me I can't, if you have that determination and talent behind it, you can succeed. And, and mm. it, also people around you that believe in you, because it's people that also make it happen. You can't do it on your own. Wise words. So. V- very, very good. I really like that because it, you know, really comes down to uh, the mental game of of being a musician, I guess. Yeah. In in some ways, so you've also seen, you know, people reaching the top, and uh, that's not necessarily, you know, it's, it's hard to stay on the top. So, have you seen people, um, you know, falling deep from the top, or also other people? staying there for longer what makes the difference is it people that it gets to the head and then they eventually crash the plane into the mountains or others stay more level-headed is is that is that true or what is it like for people who who stay there for a long time well i think that i, I think that it, yeah i think that well, well cool and the gang stayed there for a long time mm. you know they were big around 1970 and then they had a resurgence in 79 and they were till like 85 or 86 um did well the six albums that i did with them they did really well um they did one more on their own and then the lead singer left um and some key figures weren't involved anymore but they had a pretty good run i don't think very few people last forever i mean you know there's aerosmith and tom jones and people like that that just seem to and the stones and it seems like they'll just keep going until they can't go anymore um, at the same time, I've seen people come and go. Like, for example, um, Savage Garden, mm. uh, two very talented guys, and their first album was huge. Uh, I think it did 10 million copies out of the box in, in the United States. They had a second album, which didn't do nearly as well, and then they broke up. Okay. And there's quite a few bands that that happened. I mean, Steely Dan was a band that was a great, well, it wasn't really a band, it was two guys, but, you know, they had a great run. And then there was differences between them. Simon and Garfunkel ended mm-hmm. up with differences between them. Uh, a lot of times there's just bands have had enough of each other and then they just, you know, break up and reform in some cases later on as a different band with different lineups. So, um, yeah, I think the bands that, like, um, there's quite a few. Uh, maybe if you look into the history of One Hit Wonders, you'll see bands that like had that big success and then something came off the track, came off the rails, and they just, uh, you know, lost it and disappeared. Mm. And there's quite a few of them. You probably know a few yourself. Absolutely, yes. And, um, yeah. Uh, so there's usually something behind it you know, some reason why it didn't go on. But I th- I think if you start with a band with the common, like the thing about Cool and the Gang was they were really a group. Uh, they, they formed a corporation within themselves and they took it seriously and they were determined to just keep keep it up. And they oh, that's, toured. That's interesting. So they had a, a, a well-formed business structure behind their band? Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yes. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, and so they, you know, they've continued to tour well, up until they were supposed to be a blues fest, blues fest um, last year, and then of course it got canceled. But mm. um, so yeah, some some bands have longevity, and it's usually because they have a common goal. Yeah. And you know, I'm sure that they didn't all agree with everything um, that they all had to say, but enough so that they could continue on, and that was a, a big part of their their longevity. Mm. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um, I think it's probably time to sort of uh, move towards the the finishing line with this interview, Jim. Um, 
Okay. It, if we think about maybe one last question for me, when, when we think about the musicians that get into the market today that picked up, you know, a guitar and learned and uh, hit the market these days, they face very different challenges than, you know, what would you remember from, from your past? What advice would you have for, for those people if they want to make it in the industry, if they want to be a musician for, for a long time? Um, well, being able to play well is important, obviously, because it, you know there's a lot of musicians out there and and a lot of good ones. I think if you can if you can hook up with somebody um, that has some like an artist or a band and get yourself involved in that, so that you have kind of a good outlet for your your skills, but also some kind of a future. Mm. Um, this doesn't necessarily p pertain to um, uh, musicians, it has more to do with songwriters, but I knew a songwriter um, and she she was very good, and she would always make sure that the people that she wrote with either had a deal or had a good manager that was good at getting deals mm. so that she would be pretty much guaranteed that her songs would get recorded and released. Yes. So, as far as musicians go, if they can get on, get, latch on to a situation like that so that they're going to be um, you know, almost guaranteed some work for a while. And the other thing is, um, and I try to encourage people to do this, if you're in the studio recording, then that's an excellent opportunity to help with the song. Sometimes the arrangements need help, sometimes the lyrics need some tweaking, the melody needs some tweaking, the structure, whatever. And they'll have ideas. And if they can um, present their ideas and they start to get accepted, then they're a musician slash songwriter slash producer you know i i've got a few producing gigs because uh, i was the engineer and i had things to say and help out and you know next album they were looking for a producer and so they would ask me so the more things that you can do the, the more opportunities you'll have for you know to to make this thing work over an extended period of time Fantastic. Thank you. That's really good advice. So in some ways, it all comes down to being a people person and collaboration. Absolutely. Mm. Yep. Really good words to finish this up with. Jim, thank you so much for making the time today. Um, really exciting to speak to you and you know to tap into your wisdom. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you again, Jim Bonafont, for sharing your knowledge and wisdom uh, with the younger generation of, of producers. This is such an amazing story, and I'm so glad that I had the chance to speak to you. I really hope there was some interesting information in today's episode for you. Jim still produces today, and occasionally he takes on new projects. The links to Jim Bonafont's social media profiles are in the show notes just after finishing the episode. Why don't you just scroll down and uh, have a quick look and visit his profiles. Uh, while you're at it, please also click the link uh, to rate and review this episode. I would appreciate it if you could please spare me a few seconds of your time and click the five-star rating button and please write a short review. That would really mean the world to me. Thank you very much for joining me today on my birthday. You have a great day. I'll speak to you next week. Thank you and bye-bye.